We're wait. We're waiting for a few minutes for. She's here now. No, we're waiting. Aren't we waiting for that language? Oh, it's. Oh, I need it then. Okay. Oh my gosh, we're out of control already. So, <laughs> welcome everybody. I'm going to call the uh, hearing to order. The subcommittee will come to order and the chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Welcome everyone back as we continue the discussion regarding coal ash. Today we are hearing from our stakeholder panel and because of some scheduling conflicts, uh, we will convene and hear from the EPA next week. From my transcribers, can you hear me? Fine. Okay. A couple of months ago, we heard from EPA and stakeholders about the final COASH rule. We discussed the problems associated with the Im implementation, in particular, the fact that the, the final rule is self-implementing, meaning that there will be no regulatory oversight and no enforceable permits. The fact that if states implement permit programs, they will not operate in lieu of the federal rule, so regulated entities must comply with two sets of requirements. And the fact that only the only mechanism for enforcement of the final rule is through citizen suits, which will result in an unpredictable array of regulatory interpretations, as judges throughout the country are forced to make technical compliance decisions that are better left to a regulatory agency. As a result, we heard from almost all the stakeholders at our January hearing that a legislative solution is still needed to best regulate coal ash. Since our last hearing, we have been working to develop a legislative solution that does two things. Uh, one, takes into account all of the hard work EPA put into developing sound technical standards protective of human health and the environment, and second, utilize a framework developed in previous legislation requiring the states to develop enforceable permit programs that will continue contain minimum federal standards. This brings us here today to discuss the draft legislation we think accomplishes both of those goals. We are keeping the bill as a discussion draft because this is an open process during which we will continue efforts to collaborate with our colleagues in the House and our friends in the Senate, work with the EPA on technical assistance, and of course welcome suggestions from all of you to improve the bill. The basics of the discussion draft are simple. The bill requires that every state have a permit program and every permit program will contain minimum requirements based on EPA's final rule. Every permit program will address inactive surface impoundments or legacy sites in the same manner as EPA dealt with them in the final rule. They will have to decide within two months from the date of enactment whether they will be closed within three years from the date of enactment or whether they will be regulated like any other active disposal unit. Compliance timeframes are comparable to the final rule, and for any lag, we will gain the benefit of having an enforceable permit program. Furthermore, the discussion draft does not in any way impact the ability to bring citizen suits. The draft legislation does not require owners and operators to post their operating records on the internet because this is a remnant of a self-implementing program. But the draft requires states to make information regarding groundwater monitoring data, structural stability, emergency action plans, fugitive dust control plans, cert certifications regarding closure, and information regarding corrective action remedies available to the public. We heard from a number of witnesses at our last hearing that a key problem with the self-implementing final rule was that EPA was forced to eliminate certain flexibility in particular with respect to groundwater monitoring and corrective action due to the lack of state oversight. Because requirements will be implemented through state permit programs, the draft legislation allows the implementing agency on a site-specific basis to provide flexibility for groundwater monitoring or corrective action taken into account risk-based factors. At our last hearing, we also heard about a few other provisions in the final rule that were problematic including the retroactive application of the location of siting restrictions, the requirement that unlined impoundments that exceed a groundwater protection standard close with no opportunity to remedy the problem through corrective action, and that surface impoundments that miss a deadline to access structural stability must stop operating and close. 
Forced closure of impoundments with no analysis of whether the impoundment is or can be operated safely may be appropriate under a self-implementing rule with no regulatory involvement. But the goal of the draft legislation and the state permit programs is to ensure that surface impoundments are operated safely. And if they are not, then they will be corrected or closed. As we work on this draft legislation, we acknowledge the amount of time and effort the EPA put into drafting a final rule that is fully protective of human health and the environment. And because actions speak louder than words, we did this by directly incorporating the exact provisions and the policy of the final rule into the discussion draft. That being said, we still believe that a legislative solution is the best way to dealing with the regulation of coal ash because of the significant limitations of the rule. We look forward to hearing from all our witnesses and hope Mr. Stanislaus will be able to provide some helpful comments on the discussion draft next week. In particular, ECOS and Eswatmo, uh, since they will be tasked with creating permit programs that meet the minimum standards criteria set out in the legislation. I would like again to thank the administration for all the cooperation we have received on this issue. EPA has been extremely constructive and helpful during the last Congress and recently working through the issues with the final rule and the discussion draft. I would also like to specifically thank ECOS and Atuamo for their continued participation and invaluable input on the mechanics of implementation. Last, I would like to express my appreciation to Mr. McKinley for his longstanding leadership on this issue as we continue the process of trying to figure out how to effectively regulate coal ash. As always, we appreciate all of our witnesses for being here and look forward to your testimony. With that, I yield five minutes to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning. I thank the members of our witness panel for participating in today's hearing and for offering their thoughts on the discussion draft, the improving Coal Combustion Residuals Regulation Act. In the 35 years since Congress passed the Resource Reuse and Recovery Act, or RICRA, the Environmental Protection Agency has been studying this issue, and it has been the subject of intense debate. During this same time, communities in many states have experienced problems from inadequate handling and disposal of ca uh, coal ash. It is long past time to resolve these issues and indeed move forward. Earlier this year, we heard from the agency and from other stakeholders about EPA's final rule on the disposal of coal ash. This rule has taken many years and is the result of an extensive public process. The rule represents a compromise amongst the stakeholders in this issue. And so it isn't surprising that some groups are unhappy with certain provisions of the rule. But I continue to believe the rule should move forward. I realize that some of our witnesses today prefer the approach taken by this draft legislation. At this point, however, I do not see the need for legislation. There is a need for consistent, fair, and rigorous oversight of the rule's implementation. If the rule does not result in appropriate coal ash disposal, or if it results in conflicts between state and federal authorities, or leads to an excess of litigation, it can be revised or Congress can pass legislation to correct any problems that are identified. At this point, any problems with the rule are speculative, but the problems of coal ash disposal across the country are not. Spills, windborne ash, and groundwater contamination have caused serious health and environmental problems and continue to require expensive cleanup efforts. Properties and businesses have been severely damaged. This situation should not be allowed to continue. The EPA finally has taken appropriate action under the law. We should now monitor the rules implementation and do that very carefully. Again, I thank the witnesses for taking time to appear before the subcommittee this morning. And uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I thank you and yield back the remainder of my time. Is there anyone from the panel that would like to use about two minutes, I think we have left. Anyone? If not, I yield back. My gentleman yields back his time. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you've heard, for 35 years, for 35 years, Congress has been wrestling with how to handle fly ash. For 35 years. After countless hearings, meetings, amendments, and legislation in the past, we come here with a draft piece of legislation crafted with the help of the state environmental and, and solid waste officials, 
committee staff, and with the input of the EPA. The regulation may have been finalized in December, but it provided no certainty to those 316,000 hardworking Americans who recycle fly ash. This rule did not provide closure on a number of issues. It is simply not acceptable to the status quo. However, what is accepted or what is acceptable, what is acceptable is the legislation before us, this draft piece, ensures that the states have the flexibility they need to make the program work and are able to complete it within a reasonable time frame. This draft legislation guarantees that every state must, not may, must have a coal ash permit program and it, and it must contain the minimum federal standards set out under the finalized rule. Bottom line, this legislation provides certainty while the December ruling left the industry still scratching their heads. It would be responsible for this committee to continue to promote and push this draft legislation and work with all the stakeholders and the interested groups around this country to bring closure to this issue and end 35 years of unknown. I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, gentlemen, um uh, would yield back, I, but before he does, I would look to the Republican side to see if anyone would like to use the, the remaining time. Seeing none, on even my colleagues on the on the Democrat side, seeing none, uh, the gentleman yields back his time. I want to make sure that uh, y'all can hear out there, not just folks on the panel, but the folks who are sitting in the back, because usually there's some speakers. Uh, it's, the feed is working, but the spe I don't think the speakers are working. You're working on it, okay. So for my uh, for so for the pet for the panel, if you can use your uh, military voice down from the diaphragm. Uh, oh, uh, well, use your military voice down from the diaphragm. Uh, the uh, before we go to the panel, I, I I neglected to recognize the ranking member of the full committee. That's a major faux pas. Uh, Congressman Pallone from New Jersey is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Shimkus. <laughs> this is the second hearing this Congress on the important topic of coal ash. In January, the subcommittee heard from EPA and stakeholders about the agency's new final rule. After years of debate at the agency and in Congress over the proper regulation of coal ash, the agency had reached a verdict. EPA's final rule reflects a tremendous effort and it will, for the first time, provide the framework for addressing this serious environmental problem. This rule is the product of a robust public process, including field hearings and several rounds of public comment, and it reflects the input of over 450,000 consumers, including states, industry groups, environmental groups, and individual concerned citizens. In the end, EPA finalized a rule that addressed almost all the concerns this subcommittee has heard about for years. Those in the coalish recycling industry who make things like concrete and wall boards submitting, substituting coal ash for virgin material had sought a non-hazardous rule under subtitle D of RICRA, and that is what they got. Those in the electric utility industry wanted a subtitle D rule that would not require them to retrofit their existing impoundments with liners, and that's what they got. And states wanted a mechanism to set up their own programs to implement federal standards and to have EPA approve them, and that is what they got. The only stakeholders who really did not get what they sought in this rule were the environmental and public health advocates who wanted a stronger subtitle C rule with a requirement that the giant unlined pits currently receiving this dangerous waste to be retrofitted to protect groundwater. Other than those calls to strengthen the rule, the reaction to EPA's rule has been positive. The agency testified that they have every confidence in the rule and do not see a need for legislation, and members on both sides of the aisle express their support. So I am surprised that we find ourselves here today considering legislation that would replace that rule before it has taken effect and undermine the robust public process that went into it. I'm even more surprised that the stakeholders who are here today expressing support for legislation are the same ones whose concerns have been addressed in the rule. I don't see a need for legislation at this time. Instead, I think EPA and the state should be allowed to move forward and implement the final rule subject to this committee's oversight. I do want to say a few words about this specific legislation that is the subject of today's hearing. 
This new proposal retains the problems of past proposals which have been discussed extensively in the subcommittee. It would create a new model of delegation to states with a sharply curtailed role for EPA. It does not include a legal standard of protection, a substantive EPA rule, role in reviewing state programs, or EPA backstop enforcement authority. The new proposal presents additional concerns as well because necessary health protections included in EPA's final rule are left to state discretion or left out entirely. Groundwater monitoring protection, closure requirements, cleanup requirements, all could be weaker under this bill than under the final rule. If anything, we should be strengthening the protections in the final rule and not weakening them. So I think this legislation is unnecessary and dangerous for public health and the environment. I applaud the EPA for their hard work on the coal ash final rule, and I hope this subcommittee can move forward in an oversight role as implementation begins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back his time. Uh, now the uh, chair will recognize our panelists one at a time with an introduction and then your opening statement. Uh, your full statement submitted for the record. So first I'd like to uh, uh, welcome and recognize uh, David Paler, director of the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. On behalf of the Environmental Council of the States, uh, sir, welcome, and you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Shemkus, Ranking Member Tonko, and members of the subcommittee, good morning. My name is David Paler. I'm the director of the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, and I appreciate the opportunity to share with you Virginia's v views on the draft bill. I'm also representing the Environmental Council of the States, ECOS, whose members are leaders of the state and territorial environmental protection agencies. Many state regulators have firsthand experience with the devastating results of CCR impoundment failures, breaches and releases releases, destroy property, and contaminate natural resources. ECOS has worked on the CCR rule uh, issue for many years. ECOS resolution on CCR regulation was first passed in 2008, and ECOS testified in April 2013 in support of legislation to amend RICRA to create a defensible and strong CCR program that could be run by the states. After EPA signed a final CCR rule in December, ECOS testified before this subcommittee supporting the final rule's technical requirements, but stating that the legislation to amend RECRA was still needed for several reasons. The final rule creates a dual federal and state regulatory system that will be confusing and resource intensive. The final rule's schedules would require states to achieve final solid waste management plan amendments on an aggressive schedule which could not be met by many states. The final rule's self-implementing approach would make RECRA citizen suits the primary enforcement vehicle, marginalizing the role of state regulation, oversight, and enforcement, and thus creating uncertainty for the regulated community. ECOS has reviewed the draft bill and found that it positively addresses the concerns. The draft bill leverages and codifies the extensive technical work in EPA's final rule. It provides that states may adopt, implement, and enforce CCR programs. The draft bill would give state environmental agencies 24 months to certify their programs uh, with a pot potential for an additional 12 months. This would provide most states with, the existing, with existing CCR programs ample time to pursue the necessary state legislative and rulemaking processes. For example, in Virginia, our regulatory process can take two to three years. The draft bill provides that the request for certification to EPA uh, be fully described, uh, that the states fully describe their programs and how they meet uh, federal requirements. The draft bill importantly provides that state programs can be more stringent or broader in scope. For example, Virginia already has authority under the Waste Management Act to require solid waste permits for the operation of a coal ash management facility, including activities related to post-closure and corrective action. The draft bill contains an important provision that allows states that already have existing programs uh, to begin using it right away. A recent survey of states indicated that 36 states, including Virginia, have permitting programs for disposal activities with 94 percent of those requiring groundwater monitoring. The draft bill contains an important requirement for states uh, to submit as part of their certifications a plan for coordination among states in the event of a release across state lines. Uh, this type of upfront planning is re relevant, especially in Virginia where we recently had um, a Dan River spill that originated in North Carolina but impacted nearly 50 miles of Virginia waterways. Uh, 
the federal bill provides an EP that EPA will operate the CCR program for a state that cannot demonstrate a sufficient program or declines to do so. The draft bill includes robust requirements for industry permit applications, provides for public information availability, and uh, state access to facilities. The bill incorporates the new, new robust technical, siting, financial assurance, uh, run-on and run-off controls, and record-keeping and structural integrity requirements. Uh, we value the flexibility that the draft bill adds uh, that will allow states to identify alternative points of compliance for monitoring alternative groundwater protection standards, remediation flexibility, and to allow unlined impoundments to operate for a period of time, providing there are no groundwater threats and the structural integrity of the berms is maintained. The draft bill sets out uh, a three to four year process for compliance. It recognizes implementation realities and still allows action in emergency situations. The legislation supports beneficial uses of coal ash, such as in concrete, road bed fill, wall boards, and other uses. Beneficial reuse of coal ash is consistent with ECO's longstanding resolution, which is appended to my testimony. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, and members of the subcommittee, I thank you for the opportunity to present my views and those of ECO's to you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now I'd like to uh, introduce Mr. Michael Forbeck, Environmental Program Manager for the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Bureau of Waste Management on behalf of the Association of State and Territorial Solid Waste Management Officials, which is the hard to say Atswamo. Or <laughs> so, so you recognize for five minutes. Hold on. And I'm president. And pull I'm, it closer to you if you okay. can. It's a little challenging. Um, I'm, I'm president of the Association of State Territorial Salt Waste Management Officials, ASWAMO, and I'm here today uh, to testify on behalf of ASWAMO. ASWAMO is an association representing the waste management and remediation programs of the 50 states, five territories, and the District of Columbia. Our membership includes state program experts with individual responsibility for the regulation and management of solid and hazardous waste. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the discussion draft Improving Coal Combustion Residuals Regulation Act of 2015. Overall, ASWAMO believes that the discussion draft has successfully captured the essential parts of the EPA rule on coal combustion residuals management that are germane to the protection of the environment and public health and has modified or added those areas that improve the rule. We also believe that the discussion draft has addressed the main concerns that ASWAMO expressed regarding EPA's final rule on CCR in a testimony before the subcommittee on January 22, 2015. While being in full agreement with issuance of the final rule on Subtitle D of the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, ASWAMO's prior testimony noted state implementation issues raised by the self-implementing construct of the RECRA Subtitle D Part 257. The concerns we voiced are summed as, up as follows. The rule's self-implementing requirements will set up the situation of dual state and federal regulatory regime, even if the state requirements meet or exceed national minimums. The use of EPA-approved state solid waste management plans as a mechanism to deal with the issue of dual regulatory authority will not fully alleviate implementation of state and federal standards since the approved solid waste management plan would not op operate in lieu of the federal standards. An ability of states to establish a regionally appropriate standards as allowed under record subtitle D two, part 258 for mis municipal solid waste landfills is constrained by the rules self-implementing requirements. Oswamo believes this discussion draft has addressed our main concerns regarding EPA's final rule in the following three ways. First, it eliminates dual state and federal regulatory authority resulting from the self-implementing construct of EPA's rule by giving states the authority to adopt and implement a CCR permit program. Many states already have a very successful permit program. For states that choose to adopt and implement the permit program, it assures state primacy through a single permit program that is enforceable by the state. This results in a clear and consistent understanding of the permitting and enforcement rules of the state. We also agree with the additional level of review by EPA to determine whether state permit programs are adequate to ensure compliance with the criteria as described in the discussion draft. Second, by directly giving states the authority to implement a CCR rule, uh, 
or program, the discussion draft eliminates the uncertainty of state-only implementation through the Solid Waste Management Plan as the mechanism. The certification process under the draft legislation could allow for ex expedited implementation of the technical requirements. Third, we appreciate that the draft legislation allows the flexibility to the states to have regionally appropriate state standards for groundwater monitoring and corrective action. In addition to the draft, le in addition to the draft legis legislation addressing the concerns expressed in our previous testimony, Aswamo is pleased that the legislation requires financial assurance for post-closure care of inactive surface impoundments to assure a long-term compliance with environmental and public health requirements. Financial, financial assurance is an important component in state waste programs, and Aswamo has supported the inclusion of a financial insur assurance as a key program element in the final EPA CCR rule under Subtitle D. We would like to offer to the subcommittee's consideration one modification to, to draft legislation at this time. Under the agency authority for inspections, we ask that the subcommittee consider not limiting and implementing agency's authority to enter a site for purposes of inspection to only at reasonable times. This could be construed to mean during normal working hours. The timing of inspections should be at the discretion of the state to allow for after hour inspections. Thank you again for providing me the opportunity to testify on this draft legislation, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair now recognizes um, Jim Rower, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the Executive Director of the Utility Solid Waste Activities Group on behalf of USWAG, Edison Electric Institute, National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, and the American Public Power Association. Thank you. Recognized for five minutes. Chairman Schimkus, Chairman Schimkus Ranking Member Polo uh, Tonko, excuse me, he left. Uh, members of the subcommittee, good morning. I'm pleased to present the views of the utility industry, USWAG, APPA, EEI, and NRECA on the Improving Coal Combustion's Residuals Regulation Act of 2015. When I testified at the oversight hearing, before the committee on EPA uh, CCR rule, I made clear that while we support EPA's decision to regulate coal ash as a non-hazardous waste, there were significant flaws in the rule. Because the rule can't be delegated to the states, it's self-implementing, and regulated facilities must comply with the rule's requirements, irrespective of whether it's adopted by the states. Since state coal ash regulations cannot operate in lieu of federal regulations, we must comply with dual and potentially inconsistent federal and state regs. This is unlike other federal environmental regulatory regimes, including EPA's Subtitle C Hazardous Waste Program, where Congress views the states as key partners in implementing and enforcing federal regulation and expressly authorizes the states to adopt and implement the federal regime in lieu of EPA. The rule's only compliance mechanism is for a state or citizen group to bring suit in a federal district court, so an excess of litigation is guaranteed. Legal disputes regarding compliance can only be determined on a case-by-case -case basis by different federal district courts across the country. Federal judges will be forced to make complex technical decisions regarding compliance instead of regulatory agencies that have technical expertise and experience to better address those issues. Because of these fundamental flaws in the statutory structure under which the, issue, the rule was issued, legislation amending RECRA is necessary for EPA's rule to be implemented in an effective and practical manner. The discussion draft would do this. The bill would establish a permit program for implementation of the regulations issued by EPA, eliminating problems associated with the self-implementing nature of the rule. Under the bill, virtually all aspects of the rule would be implemented through state CCR permit programs or by EPA if the states don't adequately adopt and implement the rule. This structure is similar to the manner in which Congress previously amended RECRA to allow EPA's Subtitle D, Municipal Solid Waste Landfill Rules, to be implemented through state permit programs. The bill would also require coal ash permits to include conditions not included in EPA's final rule, including financial assurance requirements, and would preserve the ability of the states to regulate more stringently than the federal rule. Authorizing the states to implement the rule through permit programs would eliminate the problem of dual and inconsistent federal and state regulation. Equally important, having EPA's rule implemented by a state regulatory agency eliminates the compliance dilemma where our members and the public at large are left to their own devices to determine what is required to come into compliance. The utility industry will be investing huge capital resources to comply with the rule. 
The bill will provide the regulatory certainty for those investment decisions since compliance will be specified by a regulatory agency and spelled out in a permit. The bill would establish a rational and efficient enforcement scheme by enabling state regulatory agencies to enforce the rule as opposed to having enforcement borne solely on the back of citizen suits as it is under EPA's rule. EPA currently has no role in administering or enforcing its rule. The bill would increase EPA's authority by directing it to review the adequacy of state permit programs or to implement those programs where the states choose not to or the state per program is inadequate. In addition, and importantly, the bill does not limit in any way the ability of a citizen group to bring enforcement actions under RECRA's citizen suit provision. The bill eliminates reliance on federal district courts for interpreting and enforcing the rule, avoiding the specter of differing and potentially inconsistent application of the rule between or even within states. EPA dropped from the final rule certain site-specific risk-based options for applying elements of the regulations that were in its proposal, reasoning that those risk-based decisions require regulatory oversight. Thus, state programs that enable regulators to issue tailored site-specific risk-based options for coal ash management are superseded by the one-size-fits-all approach in EPA's rule. The bill establishes regulatory agency oversight in implementing the rule and therefore appropriately restores the ability of the implementing agency to tailor aspects of the rule to accommodate site-specific cons factors consistent with the approach of EPA's uh, proposed rule as well as the Federal Municipal Solid Waste Program. For example, the proposed rule would have allowed a facility to establish an alternative risk-based groundwater protection standard. EPA removed that option precisely because there was no regulatory oversight or approval regarding the establishment by the owner and operator of that alternative standard. The bill allows the permitting agency to establish, where appropriate, an alternative risk-based groundwater protection standard, the same option provided to permit writers in EPA's municipal solid waste landfill rule. I thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to present the views of the utility industry on the discussion draft, which we believe will allow EPA's new coal ash rule to be implemented in an effective and practical manner. Thank you. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Lisa Evans, Senior Administrative Counsel from Earth Justice. You're recognized for five minutes. Welcome. Thank you very much. Chairman Shimkus, Ranking Member Tonko, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity today to discuss the bill offered by Representative McKinley. I'm Lisa Evans, Senior Administrative Counsel for Earth Justice. I have had the privilege of testifying previously before the subcommittee concerning the serious harm caused by coal ash to our health, economy, and environment. I have spoken about the hundreds of sites where coal ash has harmed Americans nationwide by poisoning water, fouling air, and threatening the very existence of communities near coal ash dams. Today we stand at a crossroads. In December, EPA's first ever coal ash rule finally put the nation on the road to safer toxic waste disposal, which will help prevent water pollution, avoid catastrophic spills, promote cleaner air, and encourage robust public engagement by communities living near coal ash dumps. Yet the bill proposed by Representative McKinley would run us off this road and drag us into a dark and dangerous detour where almost none of the protections of the new EPA rule would survive intact. Worst of all, it's a one-way trip that permanently deprives citizens of consistent nationwide protection from the second largest industrial waste stream in the country. Make no mistake, this bill is an unwarranted and dangerous detour that guts the new EPA rule and permanently removes critical public health safeguards. Let me be very sp specific. The requirements in Representative McKinley's bill are not the same, not nearly the same, as the requirements in the EPA rule. Today's bill eliminates many requirements entirely, weakens others, and delays all. The following are some examples. First, the bill will eliminate the guarantee of public access to information concerning contaminated sites and dangerous dams. Communities will likely be unable to find out if there are toxic chemicals in their water, spills in their neighborhood, or unstable dams above their homes. Second, the bill will eliminate the, ban the rules ban on storing and dumping coal ash directly in drinking water. Unlike the EPA rule, there is no ban on operating a coal ash pond directly in an aquifer. Ponds that are located there now, and there are many, can continue to dump toxic waste, and new dumps can be built on top of drinking water sources. Third, the bill will eliminate the rule's national standard for drinking water protection and cleanups. 
According to this bill, a state can choose to allow more arsenic, more lead, more mercury, more thallium in the groundwater and not be bound by federal health standards. Fourth, the bill will eliminate the requirement to quickly close legacy ponds. The bill will likely delay cleanup of legacy sites for years and allow contaminated and abandoned ponds like the Dan River Dam that burst last February to escape all safety requirements, including inspections, for up to seven years. The bill also contains a loophole that could allow inactive ponds to escape all closure requirements entirely. Fifth, the bill will eliminate the polluter's responsibility to respond and notify the public of toxic spills. Sixth, the bill will eliminate the state's duty to require cleanup of such toxic spills. According to the bill, the utility, agency, the utility industry need not clean up spills if states don't want to require it. Lastly, the bill will permanently establish an inconsistent patchwork of state programs which need not meet any standard of protection for health and the environment and which will cause uncertainty nationwide. Undoubtedly, this bill will harm the health, economy, and environment of communities near more than 1,000 coal ash dump sites. Yet last December, the EPA bent over backwards to satisfy the concerns of industry, recyclers, and states. It delivered a rule that characterized coal ash as non-hazardous, fails to ban continued use of unlined ponds, exempts beneficial use, establishes extended and flexible time frames for compliance and closure, and regulates coal ash under the weakest of the three options proposed in 2010. In closing, I want to reiterate that I appreciate the opportunity to address the subcommittee. However, there are other voices that must be heard. Last week, 143 individuals and groups personally impacted by coal ash dumping sent a letter to this subcommittee requesting the opportunity to speak. The words of those actually harmed by toxic dumping are sorely missing today. If impacted community members were here today, citizens from Illinois, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Missouri who live near leaking coal ash ponds, citizens from North Carolina and Virginia who live along the Fall Dan River, citizens from the Moapa Reservation in Nevada and the, Nevada, the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico whose air is thick with ash, these citizens and many others would ask this committee not to throw away this limited coal ash rule for essentially no rule at all. They would ask the committee not to delay and not to remove critical health protections for their families and communities. Today, I respectfully echo their plea. Thank you for your time, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you very much, and now I recognize myself for the first um, round of questioning. Um, and I'd just like to start, you know, the intent was to take the rule and codify it. And I think that's what we've been able to do. So it makes it, it, makes it w easier to comply with and understandable when it does create consistency across the, across the country. And that was the intent. We specifically took EPA language in the rule on the exact language on design requirements, post-closure, air criteria, record keeping, runoff, run on and run off controls, hydrologic and hydrologic capacity requirements and inspections. Those are aspects that we took the exact language in the rule. So, you know, I just appreciate the work that we've done to try to move in a direction where we're working with the EPA, uh, take their rule and make it stronger. And that's the really the position of the, the majority on the subcommittee. So, uh, Mr. Taylor, does ECO support the approach taken in this draft legislation? Uh, uh, yes, I uh, believe that uh, ECOS does uh, support it. And um, it's for the reasons that you mentioned that it uh, takes the EPA federal rule, which we believe uh, uh, was a positive step forward and uh, addresses some of those additional concerns like uh, dual uh, oversight and uh, financial assurance. In your opinion, does the draft legislation address the implementation issues associated with the final rule, including, as you just mentioned, dual regulation systems and the enforcement only through citizen suits? Uh, yes, I believe it does address those. Yeah, and that's part of the debate on this legislation. The way the rule comes out is the only way you really can get enforcement is through the c courts and every federal district court around this country, which are in the hundreds, could then 
enforce a different standard than what a national standard or a standard working through the states. Is that your understanding, Mr. Paler? I believe I believe that uh, this um, would create a, a a uniform standard across the country, and that's one of the strengths that it provides. Yes, uh, Mr. Forbeck, do you agree with that? Uh, yes, I do. I, I believe it. Uh, it will give a. Um, uh, it gives more. Uh, it eliminates the confusion that the solid waste management plan had had provide, and would provide a uh, a, a, a single point of permitting. That so that's Tuamo supports this legislation. We do support. We uh, we are very pleased that it incorporate the EPA rule and and also added the financial assurances that, that, that we requested and has a single permit. Let me just follow up. Do you read the legislation as allowing states the ability to pick and choose which requirements to include in a state permit program? No, I do not. There are minimum st standards or permit requirements uh, that the states would. And the minimum of standards as you evaluate this draft legislation comes from where? From the EPA rule. And from the legislature. So the minimum, the minimum stand. I just, just for the record, the minimum standards you interpret is coming from where? Well, it, it comes from the originally from the EPA role That's that was incorporated. Great, thank you, Mr. Rower. The legislation incorporates requirements of the final rule as the minimum requirements for state permit programs. Many of the requirements are incorporated directly with no revisions, as I read earlier. There are, however, a few places where the legislation allows the implementing agency to tailor the requirements based on on-site specific risk-based decisions, in particular with respect to groundwater monitoring and corrective action. Can you explain why this is important? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, EPA recognized the legitimacy of tailoring those regulations. There's extensive discussion of that fact in the preamble, but then backed away from that, recognizing there was no federal or no regulatory uh, agency oversight of that process. The legislation would allow the state regulatory agencies to tailor the regulations to address specific site-specific concerns associated with coal ash management. What could, they do? What, what could be different? Well, one of the things would be a groundwater protection standard, for instance. Um, EPA would default to the background, the groundwater protection standard under their self-implementing rule. Where there is another state or, or federal uh, uh, health-based standard, the state regulatory agents can, can apply that in lieu, if there's no MCL to establish an alternative groundwater protection standard. Not leaving, EPA couldn't leave that to the owner and operator that does need regulatory agency oversight and the bill appropriately sets up a mechanism for the states to take that uh, approach. Great, my time's uh, close to expiring. Uh, thank you very much, and I recognize Mr. Tonko for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for far too long, communities have been subject to the uh, serious risks associated with inadequate coal ash disposal. Coal ash releases have polluted our air and water supplies, and structural failures have devastated communities and resulted in very expensive and very complicated cleanup efforts. EPA's final rule will go a long way, I believe, to address these concerns. Uh, this bill appears to reverse this course, eliminating some of EPA's minimum requirements and weakening or delaying others. Uh, Ms. Evans, um, how do the bill's location requirements measure up to those in the final rule? And uh, if they're not the same, why is that difference important? Thank you, Representative Tonko. Um, the location standards differ radically from the location standards in the EPA rule. Uh, one of the most important uh, restrictions is the placement, the prohibition against the placement of ash within five feet of the groundwater table. In other words, you can't place ash uh, any longer within five feet of a potential drinking water source. The uh, proposed legislation does not incorporate that location standard. So you, what you have is um, the, you do not have the prohibition um, of ponds that are currently located in a drinking water aquifer, they will not have to close. Um, that is a, a radical change in the, uh, the requirements because we know um, for sure that there are many ponds uh, that are currently in contact with their waste in contact with the groundwater. Um, the rule also, I mean, the, the bill also does not incorporate uh, restrictions for wetlands, uh, for seismic areas, uh, for, and for fault areas. Thank you. And the bill differs from the EPA rules closure requirements, 
for disposal units that don't meet important criteria like liner designs, structural integrity, or location restrictions. The bill keeps these facilities open, allowing deficient structures to continue to receive waste for years. Ms. Evans, how do the closure requirements of the bill compare to those in the EPA rule? Yeah, the closure requirements in the bill are, are much more lenient and will allow ponds that are contaminating groundwater to continue to operate and continue to accept waste uh, for uh, 8.5 years in the case of an unlined surface impoundment. Um, and this, of course, endangers those communities near those impoundments that are reliant on, on drinking groundwater. Um, EPA has identified unlined ponds as being uh, the most uh, dangerous way to dispose of waste. And when you allow unlined ponds that are leaking above a health standard into groundwater to continue to operate uh, for 8.5 years, uh, that certainly is not the same re requirements as you had in the EPA rule. EPA rule would require um, the, the ponds to cease accepting waste within six months and close. And so the uh, requirements under EPA's rule, uh, as indicated, will take effect much more quickly than those under the, under the bill? Absolutely. Communities are looking forward to the application of the requirements as early as September. Um, many requirements are in effect six months from the date of publication. Uh, if that's at the end of this month, we're going to see uh, relief for uh, contaminated uh, air, contaminated air quality from dust. Um, we're going to see public information posted on utility websites. Um, we will see the initiation of inspection at high and significant hazard ponds uh, on a weekly basis and a monthly basis. So communities will get immediate relief from the EPA rule. Um, and under the bill, uh, this relief is going to be laid be delayed at least two to three years, and in probably in most cases, much longer. And the um, requirement that, as you indicate, facilities can post operational and compliance data on a publicly available internet site without exception. Um, this both incentivizes industry compliance up front and empowers local citizens with information they need to keep an eye on what's happening in their communities. How important are these? Uh, public disclosure provision in EPA's rule? Uh, the, the public disclosure provisions are critical to EPA's rule, and EPA's rule is explicit as to what has to be posted. The difference in the bill is that there are general public participation or public notice provisions, but it gives states discretion on how they require that information to be um, to be made public. Um, currently, information in many states is made public, but it's at state agencies where citizens at great difficulty and great expense um, must uh, request a file review, often wait a substantial amount of time, and spend a significant amount of money obtaining that data. So often this data is, in the real world, not available to citizens. But the actual groundwater monitoring data, uh, dust control plans, inspections, assessments of structural stability, all those will be posted uh, according to the EPA rule on a publicly accessible website free of charge to all communities impacted by the dump sites in their communities. Um, I have exhausted my time, so I yield back. General yields back time. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Mr. Mississippi, Mr. Harper, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to each of you for being here. Mr. Paler, the draft legislation directly incorporates the technical requirements in EPA's final coal ash rule and establishes a baseline for coal ash management across the country. Do you believe that the minimum requirements set forth in the legislation will ensure that states develop effective and environmentally protective permit programs for coal ash management, and if so, why? Um, we do believe that uh, it would provide um, a federal baseline and then um, uh, states would also be able to, um, to go beyond that with uh, their own site-specific needs as well. The bill contains a provision requiring states to develop plans for coordination among states in the event of a release that goes across state lines. Why is that important? Well, it's important to Virginia because we recently this year had an experience where uh, there was a release in North Carolina. The majority of the stream impact was in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to, for states to have some upfront planning and coordination uh, would just streamline the process should we have another 
uh, unfortunate incident like that. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. Long time? I'll yield. Uh, is that in the current EPA rule? Not to my knowledge. Does anyone know? I, I, I don't think it is. Thank you. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Paler, your written testimony notes that the draft bill includes the new robust technical uh, uh, citing financial assurance, run-on and run-off controls, uh, record-keeping, and structural integrity requirements published by EPA uh, in the final CCR rule, and that EPA did a very good job developing the technical requirements of the final CCR rule. Your written testimony also states that you value the flexibility the draft bill adds. Can you explain why the added flexibility is a good thing? Uh, the added flexibility is important uh, primarily because of um, uh, being able to deal with site-specific issues, especially when you're looking at uh, groundwater uh, contamination, issues of groundwater flow and uh, uh, nearby receptors and everything are, are very important. allows you to tailor your response uh, to the site rather than a one-size-fits-all approach. Okay. And your written testimony also states that the draft legislation provides a federal backstop. Would you please explain to us what that means? Well, the federal backstop means that there is um, enforcement authority at the federal level should um, the state uh, not meet those standards, and so therefore uh, you've got the uh, the state authority. But if that if that fails, the federal government can come in and, and take action. Why is it important that the draft legislation allows for the pre-approval of a state? Uh, state permitting program? Well, a state permitting program uh, provides uh, certainty. It provides uh, uh, the ability to have site specific um, requirements on that uh, particular um, uh, facility, and it provides um, uh, more clear enforceability. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Forbick, uh, states have previously demonstrated uh, the ability to implement permit programs very similar to coal ash. So is EPA approval necessary before states begin implementing coal ash permit programs? And wouldn't EPA program approval unnecessarily delay implementation of coal ash permit programs? I think the certification program that's uh, within this, uh, this draft would actually expedite um, implementation of this, of these requirements of the rule. And states that have proven programs, uh, have proven programs and uh, permit programs can um, continue them with CCRs. And, and, and uh, in Pennsylvania, we have a very success successful program that we've done for many, many years. Thank you. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to thank my colleague um, for his efforts on this, on this uh, issue. Um, I believe I heard two concerns consistently from the first three witnesses. One of them was that the uh, main enforcement mechanism is citizen lawsuits and that that would bring uncertainty and so on. Uh, and the other one, and I'm a little confused about this one, is in uh, that it would establish inconsistent standards across states while at the same time giving states flexibility, which seemed to be something that, like, uh, you're shaking your head there. Mr. Orr, did you disagree? The inconsistent application of the rule, uh, Congressman, is due to the interpretation of the rule by the federal district court judges, not inconsistent as per uh, application and enforcement by the state regulatory agencies. At least in my testimony, the concern for a potential patchwork of interpretation stems from the self-implementing citizen suit enforcement structure of EPA's rule not of the legislation. The legislation solves that problem. How does it solve it? By having the federal standards prescribed in the rule that are EPA's rule implemented by the state regulatory agencies. There is a federal floor under which the states cannot drop. But I mean, uh, uh, well, um, my understanding is that there's a lack of a standard of protection uh, in, in the in the legis proposed legislation. Would you address that, Ms. Well, e EPA developed. Evans? Oh, I'm, excuse me. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, this bill, uh, like the other uh, bills uh, proposed by by um, Representative McKinley, lacks a protective standard of protection, and this was pointed out numerous times by uh, CRS. 
what that means is that there really is no federal floor that, that Mr. Rohr is, is describing. Um, states are free to interpret the terms um, uh, that are not defined. They can define their own terms. Um, and they can run their programs without oversight that has a standard of prote uh, protection of human health and the environment. The standard of protection of human health and the environment is, is a watchword of RICRA. It applies in all of RICRA's programs, except it, if this bill passes, it won't be applied to coal ash. Um, and this is a, a very dangerous omission because EPA uh, essentially will have uh, very narrow oversight is to be uh, completely ineffective. Because if an agency can't look at a state program and say these permits don't protect human health and the environment, therefore this is a deficient program, their oversight will be meaningless. And essentially this is exactly what the bill says. Um, and if, if I could talk to the, the dual enforcement, right. um, because that uh, argument is really nonsense. Um, what under RICRA, uh, the RICRA citizen supervision, um, either states or uh, citizens, when uh, filing a citizen suit, are in federal court. They're in federal court if it's a hazardous waste uh, violation. They're in federal court if it's a municipal solid waste violation. So RICRA has always operated like this, that you have federal courts interpreting state law. So the, the problem that is raised by, by USWAG in the states um, is really a problem uh, that is really something that hasn't been a problem for all the decades that RICRA has been, uh, RICRA programs have been in effect for, for decades. So, so you're concerned about the, the, uh, the citizens' lawsuits being the main enforcement mechanism? Uh, I'm not. Uh, citizen lawsuits include the state lawsuits. So it's, it's not, when one says citizen lawsuits, what that means is citizens or the states are free to enforce under the EPA rule, are free to enforce the EPA rule. States can go in and enforce those provisions as well. So any citizen suit that is brought, um, it's required that there be 60 days notice to the state. If the state wants to be the main implementing agency and wants to interpret its own regulation and enforce its own regulation, it is 100% free to do that. A citizen can't slip in with a lawsuit. They have to give 60 days, and if the state wants to maintain, uh, be the, the, the primary enforcing uh, agency and maintain 100% control over the program, a state can bring that enforcement action, can enter a consent decree, and there will not be a citizen uh, lawsuit by a citizen group. Okay, I don't know if you have enough time to answer this, but yeah. one of the things that you said concerned me was that uh, citizens wouldn't have the ability to, to determine the quality of the water that might have been contaminated. Uh, and that, uh, how could, how could uh, the, the bill prevent that from happening? Well, the bill doesn't make mandatory groundwater monitoring data. So what that means is a community that's on wells next to a coal ash pond or landfill would not necessarily, under the bill, have access to the groundwater monitoring data. So they couldn't go on a website and find out uh, what are the levels of arsenic, hexavalent chromium, lead. So they, um, but they could do it themselves. They could do the testing themselves or have a laboratory do it if well they had to pay for it. Well, they wouldn't have access to the industry wells. Right. They could test their own well, but, some, but you know, the purpose of RICRA is to prevent um, harm to health and the environment. So you want to find out what's in those industry wells, which might be um, you know, a quarter mile from your drinking water well before it gets to your well and your family. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, before I uh, move to uh, uh, Mr. Murphy, uh, Ms. Evans, you mentioned the CRS a report. If you have one on this bill, uh, we'd like to see it. I think you're referring to previous bills of past Congresses. There's no CRS report on this bill right now. The um, and there would be public disclosure through the state. And I just wanted to, with that, I yield uh, five minutes to Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the panel being here. Uh, it's a long-term issue we've got to, to deal with directly. Uh, I, I do want to uh, deal with some uh, comments that Ms. Ms. Evans, you made, and, and with regard to the bill fails to establish a protective standard. Um, I didn't hear from other panelists if they agree with that. Mr. Rower, do you agree with that? Uh, the bill takes EPA's 257 regulations, their coal ash rule, and builds a CCR permit program based on those regulations. Those regulations, the 257 regulations, are developed by EPA with that to meet that standard of care. So we believe that the bill does provide that federal standard of care 
and a federal floor. Mr. Forbeck, would, do you agree that the bill fails to establish a protective standard, or will you disagree? Mm, I disagree. I believe it does establish a actual protective standard. Mr. Pavlar? Uh, I, I would agree with those responses as well. Thank you. Uh, I mean, along those lines, I look upon it that state legislators and regulators have the authority to do some things. Uh, Ms. Evans, one of the things you're raising question with is it may get in the way of people being able to bring up uh, court cases. Uh, does it interfere with that? Am I understanding you correctly there? Um, if I understand your question, the state and citizens stand in the same legal place in that if an industry under the CCR rule is violating any of those requirements, it can bring a suit to enforce the EPA rule. There is there is nothing in the EPA rule that would stop states from um, fully adopting, fully enforcing that rule. Um, and as um, one of, uh, I think it was um, the gentleman from ECOS, has said that uh, states are ready to do this within two or three years. Okay. Um, Mr. Forbeck, uh, so based on your experience, will this draft legislation being discussed today result in a more effective implementation of requirements of the final rule than the self-implementing program, and why or why not? I believe, it, as I said in the testimony, it would be, very, it'd be more effective. One, it has a, as a single permit program, we have a, a, the state that will have the uh, jurisdiction and the um, enforcement capabilities of, 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 of uh, enforcing the, this rule. Um, in addition, the, uh, the uncertainty of the salt waste management plan as a mechanism for implementation is no longer there. We have this permit program mm -hmm. that, that would be in effect. Um, and, uh, and, and so, I mean, Pennsylvania has a very robust coal ash program, am I correct? That's correct. And uh, would you have to develop any <clears throat> new requirements or make changes to existing requirements based upon this draft legislation? We believe it would be very minimum requirements that we, we would have to change. Uh, we've been regulating coal ash for a number of years. We had uh, mm -hmm. liners requirements since the early 90s and groundwater requ requirements since the 90s. So uh, I think for Pennsylvania, it would, be, it would not be a very uh, uh, long time. So let me talk about that, that issue of the liner requirements. I mean, I, I want to make sure we have enough flexibility that as new science is developing, new um, liners, et cetera, that we don't limit anything here. So, and I think that's where this bill tries to be flexible. Would you support the inclusion of a provision to allow more latitude in liner design to capture the flexibility as science develops, as technology develops, uh, than is already provided by state law, uh, so long as it's protective of the EPA devised standard? Uh, if, it's, if it's as protective and, and, and right, as technology improves, mm -hmm. um, there could be even better methods that, that could, um, uh, could be more protective than, than the liner systems that we have now. So we would support that. Okay. Ms. Evans, you said something that caught my attention, too. You talked about <clears throat> issues with regard to uh, dams, uh, I guess coal ash dams or uh, gob piles or whatever that would lead. And what, what do you consider the risk that this bill does not address with regard to dams? Well, with regard to dams, um, uh, there are a few. Um, one of them is the location restrictions, which don't apply to dams um, mm -hmm. in wetlands, in fault areas, in seismic areas, and uh, the dams that are sitting in, uh, in um, the aquifer. Um, further, it's the delay. Um, this rule uh, wouldn't, the requirements would be at the earliest, um, in effect two to three years. And so the inspections of high hazard dams um, would not occur until two or three years, whereas so it would immediately um, be applicable. So um, the, other, the other thing is, you know, we, we keep arguing about whether this bill is the same as the EPA rule. And I would urge the committee members to, to look at my testimony and the long list of definitions that can be uh, defined by a state uh, without a protective standard um, and which could differ from EPA's uh, definitions and definitions define the applicability, the scope, the stringency of a rule. So let's take uh, dams. Uh, the states. Uh, I'm, I'm, out of, I'm out of time here. Oh, but I, can, I, I, can I just I, say that the, the uh, states can define hazard potential dams differently, uh, well, uh, as they wish, because it, that is not a definition in the bill. So they could exempt some higher significant hazard dams from those categories and thereby uh, those more stringent requirements for those more dangerous dams would not be applicable. Thank you. Chairman, this time. Can I just ask that uh, in the, if you, uh, we could ask for the record the other panelists to be able to respond to that question too. Without it, objection. Thank you. So ordered. Uh, chair now recognizes the uh, gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta, for five minutes.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks very much for our panel for being here. It's very informative, as always. Uh, if I could go back, to, uh, Mr. Rohr, if I could ask you, because the uh, question that uh, Mr. Murphy had just uh, brought up, uh, pretty much you know, the basic principle in this bill is that we are taking the EPA's role and giving more flexibility to the states, providing the same protections of the environment, and particularly the drinking water resources in ways other than those nearly approved by the EPA. And again, uh, following up where uh, Mr. Forback just uh, 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 answered uh, Mr. Murphy, would you support the minor, change, minor changes to the bill that would meet the basic principle, giving that flexibility to provide the same environmental protection if states have regulations to provide equivalent protection in different ways? USWAG has always supported regulation by the states of coal ash as a non-hazardous waste with a performance-based approach protecting the environment, protecting the groundwater resource. So that would be consistent with that view as long as it is protective uh, of the groundwater resource. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Paler, if I could ask, uh, I, if you, I saw in your testimony that 36 states have permitting for the disposal activities with 94 percent of those requiring groundwater uh, monitoring. Do you believe that most states want to implement their own permit program uh, rather than have the U.S. EPA do it for them? Uh, in general, states uh, do prefer to uh, uh, have oversight. It gives uh, uh, more direct connection uh, to the facility itself that's being regulated. Uh, we support the, the federal floor that gives consistency across states, and uh, I think most states would, would very much prefer to uh, implement their own permitting program. Thank you. And Mr. Forbeck, uh, what do you see as the role of states in protecting the environment, and how does the draft legislation accomplish that goal? I think the states are, are the first line of defense and the ones that are, are closer to, uh, to the issues, and they, they're the ones that should be enforcing uh, the, uh, the rule. And um, I think these, the capability of the uh, uh, legislation proposed legislation will allow states to do that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Paler, in your opinion, uh, will the draft legislation require every state to have a permit program that contains the minimum federal requirements? Uh, it does not require uh, every state to do that. However, if the state uh, does not have uh, mm -hmm. uh, rules that meet the federal standard or opts out on their own, then the federal government would step in and, and uh, enforce those rules. If I could just follow up again, uh, Mr. Paler, in your written testimony, uh, you note that the draft legislation lays out a three or four year process for compliance by regulated facilities, uh, but you note that the bill recognizes the implementation realities and still allows for action in any emergency situations. Um, could you explain that? Um, each, um, each impoundment is going to have its own uh, uh, site-specific uh, concerns and just the logistics of uh, identifying uh, what it takes to comply and uh, uh, and implementing that is going to take some time plus it's going to take uh, um, a couple of years for um, the states to get uh, their uh, their rules in place and so um, that just recognizes the realities of the logistics to need to do that and also um, allows for um, if, in fact, you do have an emergency situation, you move immediately. Okay, thank you. And, uh, Mr. Rohr, uh, I know my time is running short here, but the rule requires retroactive application of the location restrictions to existing surface impoundments. Can you walk me through why this is important? Uh, we believe it's unfair to apply retroactively the location restrictions. We can't move these impoundments. They are where they are. There are other provisions in the legislation that would address the concerns that are at the core of those location restrictions. We've heard there's no prohibition of putting ash directly into an aquifer. The bill contains groundwater protection standards, groundwater monitoring requirements. So the goal of the location restrictions to keep contaminants out of the aquifer are met through other, implementation, uh, other aspects of the legislation. And indeed, the inspections, uh, the safety assessments uh, uh, will all address those same concerns that are being addressed through the location restrictions. Other elements of the bill do that. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my time's expired and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, the author of the legislation, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, um, it's a draft legislation, draft piece. We're going to be working with this and we're going to make some other modifications. I'm sure to it. It's going to continue to evolve in, in this process. It has to. Uh, but I'm just curious, uh, a lot of the comments, well, the majority of the comments that have been made to date have all been about location, drinking water, and the like. Uh, and, but we haven't talked about the recycling. And so let's put this all in context again. Um, we, use, we generate for the crowd that may or may not understand this, a lot of this issue, we're, we generate about 150 million tons of fly ash annually. But we recycle 40% of that. So all, these, all this last hour and a half or two hours we've been talking about is the water. What about the recycling provision? What are we going to do? Because the preamble to the rule is, is troubling to me, and it should be troubling to everyone because the preamble says this rule defers a final determination until additional information is available. That means that they could rule back to a C. They're a D now. It could be a C in the future. It could be two weeks from now. It could be a year from now or two years from now. What we're trying to do is codify that provision so that we remove the uncertainty for the recyclers. 316,000 jobs are at risk. If they make that flip that they've just done a rule and, they, and because it's an executive rule, they could do another executive rule or through the EPA rule to say that it's a hazardous material, what happens to the recyclable material? 316,000 jobs could be at risk. Who's going to put in their house if, if and, they, and remember, their science has already been determined. It's not a hazardous material. This was done in 1993 in the year 2000. It, it said it's not a hazardous material. It wasn't until this administration said, I don't care what the science says. I want to treat it as a hazardous material. And as a result, we got uncertainty. I don't think any of us would put drywall in our house or concrete in our floors or in our concrete block or in our bricks if we thought it was a hazardous material. So that's why, therefore, the EPA did their study, came back two times, said it's not hazardous. I th I'm concerned about this portion, the 40%. I'm certainly we're concerned about the other 60% of the, 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 when it goes to a landfill, and, and we'll address that. And that there's a lot of provisions that have been in there, but let's, let's make sure we have some dis debate here today about the 40% that we're trying to recycle. So you can go back if we get our panel said, is that a concern that, that they could switch back? Because they say in the preamble, it, they defer a, a final determination until further information is available. Is that a reasonable determination? Is that cause certainty? Is that with you, Mr. Paylor? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, we support beneficial reuse, which uh, by definition tells you we, th we think it's a, it's, it's a subtitle D material. Um, whether that creates uncertainty is, uh, is a great question, but the eco-states have uh, uniformly uh, supported beneficial reuse of this material. Mr. Forbeck, do you think it should be recycled? Absolutely. And Would you recycle it if it were hazardous material? It would be a concern if it was a hazardous material. Oh, concern. Yes. <laughs> uh, Aswama has supported uh, beneficial use, and that has been a concern in our, our past uh, uh, documentation uh, of, of this being labeled as, as a hazardous waste. Okay. Mr. Rower? You yeah, you, my, again, my question is, is this, is this issue the uncertainty by virtue of them being able to switch back to a, to a C from a D in any Con time? Congressman, the, the language in the preamble is very troubling. Thank you. Uh, the, le the legislation would bring regulatory certainty in this manner. Congress would be amending the statute to establish a permit program to regulate C under which the states would be regulating CCRs under subtitle D, the non-hazardous waste title of RECRA. That would provide the certainty. EPA certainly could revise those 257 criteria in the future, but the regulatory program is within subtitle D, non-hazardous waste program. It does bring the certainty that the recycling market needs. Okay. Ms. Evans, would you support recycling of the fly ash? Uh, absolutely. Uh, safe recycling of fly uh, I'm ash. I'm sorry. I've had a hard time hearing you. Oh, I'm sorry. Today. 
Uh, uh, much better. Oh, sorry about that. Keep in front of you. Um, I, I, we do um, and support safe recycling of, of coal ash, um, and I would say that. Do you think uh, this the this preamble should be tightened up a little bit to codify so that it's not set up by the the administration or the EPA can just change that at their whim? Well, well I have two responses to that. One is that it, it, it's impossible to quote unquote flip uh, the EPA if they were going to make a change. It's a long. Uh, process uh, uh, full of public participation, proposed rules. You're not, you, you can't see EPA making a unilateral decision uh, without uh, your involvement, the involvement of industry and public interest groups. So it, it's impossible to flip. Whether EPA could change its mind, which I don't think it will in the future, um, you know, is, uh, is certainly uh, inherent in, in environmental regulation. But if we're talking about certainty, what I would point to is the gross uncertainty that is created by the bill uh, to, to communities because there, are, there is no federal floor under the bill uh, for yeah. safeguards. Thank you very much. Gentlemen's time expired. Chair and I recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Bouchon, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Ms. Evans, do you, do you believe we should burn coal to generate electrical power? I believe that there are safer sources of energy. That's a yes or no. Uh, yes, uh, you do believe we should continue to use coal, or no, you think we should just eliminate coal as a source of energy generation? Well, I think it's a more nuanced question. I support the uh, transition to safer um, and more environmentally friendly uh, sources of energy. Okay, fair enough. And um, do you believe, Ms. Evans, that state regulatory agencies, because the, uh, this, through the tone of this, is it's a fed, federal versus state issue here, that do you believe that state regulatory agencies and the citizens and in individual states care about the health and well-being of their citizens at the state level? Uh, do I believe state agency, agencies care um, on yeah. the whole? Um, I, I think they do, but I think the record of state agencies um, has not been good. Um, and in, in Aswama, and the, rec and the record, in fairness, the record of the federal government's been better. Uh, the record of both agencies on coal ash has been bad. But what we've seen in terms of what I'm not, not specifically the coal ash, just is a, this is a generalized question about state. State, I mean, it's a, it's a federalism issue. Basically, a question that I have is that state, because the implication that states uh, and their agencies and citizens in their states have to have the federal government tell them specifically what to do or they will violate, you know, environmental, they'll, they'll damage the environment and they won't properly regulate things at the state level, I think, is something that has been implied, which I disagree with. So the question is, is you know, as you know, is at the state level there's legislative pressure, there's citizen pressure on the governors, the state legislators, the regulators, just that there is at the federal level. So the question I have basically is why do you feel that the, that, you know, that um, the feder federal um, uh, regulators would necessarily uh, do a better job than people are doing already at the states like Pennsylvania has described, for example? Right. Well, what we see, and I think the proof is in the evidence on the ground, um, EPA identified 157 cases of contamination from coal ash sites, sites which are wholly under uh, the authority of state agencies. We've had three major spills since 2008, um, two of which uh, were horrendous uh, in terms of their damage um, and their cost. Um, and it's lucky that no lives were taken. That record uh, indicates that state agencies are not doing their job um, as well, I would as disagree because I was a health. And then, wait, and then I mean, no, let me, I'm, I'm reclaiming my time because I was a health care provider before. You may you probably don't know that, and um, you know there's no no system in health care. You know that we when we provide health care to patients that that is perfect, and every once and every once in a while, if you understand statistics, things do occur. So I think the overall implication that that because there have been some disastrous spills, in, in total agreement with you on that, that that means that state regulators are not doing their job, I think, is an unfair assessment. Uh, and that the, the, so the question is, is again, compared to the, this draft legislation, you know, and what the EPA has done, why do you think that there, do you think that, that 
the federal government will be able to eliminate all the spills and other problems that you have? Because statistically, right, no matter what industry you're in, there's nothing that's 100 percent. Right. But the damage does indicate that on their watch, the state agencies have failed. If you compare the municipal solid waste uh, arena, where the state agencies are have a authorized program that has a federal floor and has a federal standard of protection, you're not seeing the same kind of contaminated groundwater near municipal solid waste landfills as you are near coal ash sites. So yes, when there is a federal, federally approved program, when it's got uh, specific standards and when states have to be authorized to have standards as stringent as the federal okay. standards, that can Re Reclaim my time. Mr. Rohr, can you respond to what she just said? Uh, uh, Congressman, I think comparing a situation prior to a federal standard that would be implemented through this legislation is inherently unfair. If you're comparing previous performance uh, by the state regulatory agencies when there isn't a federal regulation, which is what this bill would do, uh, just is not appropriate. Thank you. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Chairman yields back his time. Uh, Chairman, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Flores, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the panel for joining us today. Uh, Mr. Rauer, the draft legislation treats legacy sites in the same way that the EPA did under the final rule, and that is that inactive impoundments must, must either close within three years or become subject to all of the requirements to an active disposal unit. In your opinion, is three years already enough time to uh, close a surfaced impoundment? Not in, not in all cases. It's a rather complicated process of, of dewatering the facility to ensure the structural integrity of the unit, to minimize impacts of contaminants to groundwater, to ensure that you can place and then place a cap on top of that unit. There may be uh, uh, climate uh, and permitting uh, complications that would cause that period to be longer. EPA recognized this in their rule when they established a five-year time frame for closure of impoundments with the possibility of extending that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, building on that then, the, dra the legislation that Mr. McKinley drafted uh, gives the implementing agency the authority to grant a two-year extension. Uh, why is that extension there, sir? I think you already answered that, so sometimes you can't. A a ab absolutely. Okay. And, and again, I'll point to the fact that the agency for active impoundments provided for a five-year time frame with the ability to extend that closure time period by up to 10 additional years. The closure process for inactive units and active units can be quite similar. So we do need additional time. Well, let's, let's go ahead and drill into that. I think you, had, you said something to the extent that, the, uh, that you'd have to uh, demonstrate, your agency would have to demonstrate uh, why that, that was needed. Uh, tell me, give me an example of, of the demonstration uh, Again, it's not uh, a guarantee that we get that extension. It's something that the owner and operator would have to uh, petition the uh, uh, implementing agency to get. And you'd have to demonstrate that the factors are beyond control. The, the, the extension would be the same factors in EPA's rule to extend the time period, uh, climate, weather, permitting conditions, uh, permitting situations uh, require additional time. Okay. And you also have to demonstrate that the facility you're closing isn't uh, a, a threat for release or spill from it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, in some cases, I mean, going to an inactive facility and starting to, the process to, to seal it could be more disruptive to the environment than, than to uh, take your time and do it the right way. We, we certainly need to make sure that the all facilities, whether they're inactive facilities we're capping or active facilities, are closed in a safe and environmentally sound manner. Okay. And Mr. Forbeck, to, to follow up on that, in your opinion, does the draft legislation deal with inactive impoundments in, this, in the same manner as the final rule? It, it does deal with it very similar, it, but it does allow some extensions based on the conditions that uh, Mr. Rowan ex expressed. And those are important conditions. I mean, yes, again, disrupting an inactive facility prematurely without adequate uh, planning could be more harmful for the environment. Mr. Forbeck, did the final rule require regulated entities to provide financial assurance for corrective action, closure, and post-closure of coal ash disposal units? The EPA rule did not. Okay. And so doesn't this legislation actually go further than the final rule by requiring financial assurance not just for active disposal units but also for inactive surface impoundments? Yes, it does, and we feel that's a very important component of this okay. legislation. Well, thank you for your uh, for joining us today. I yield to any other Republican members the balance of my time, or I'll yield back. Okay, I yield back. Chairman yields back. Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I wanted to first ask Mr. Paler. Uh, you mentioned earlier, um, I wasn't here, uh, you, I was at the other hearing, but you mentioned earlier that citizen suits would be the sole method of enforcement under the EPA rule, but EPA strongly encouraged states to incorporate the new federal criteria into their own state solid waste management plans. So do you expect at least some states uh, will incorporate the new federal standards into into state programs, and if states adopt these requirements, do you expect them to enforce the requirements? Um, it is uh, certainly possible that some states would uh, uh, would adopt those. There would not be a uh, permitting mechanism, however, and it would be subject to a one-size-fits-all um, uh, situation. So um, there might be some spotty enforcement by states, but. Uh, um, but as a whole, the uh, the the uh, one size fits all approach to uh, federal regulation uh, would, in fact, uh, leave citizen suits uh, as the primary mechanism. Did you want to comment on that, Ms. Evans? Well, I think we, we've I've read testimony from uh, Swamo that indicates that states, uh, that following the um, EP, EPA rule signing, uh, that states were ready um, and willing to implement those programs within the states. And states certainly can implement permit programs. The requirements have to be uh, consistent with the EPA rule, but they certainly um, can tailor permits and use their authority to run uh, coal ash permit programs, you know, subsequent to the. EPA rule. All right, and then uh, e I want to continue with you, Ms. Evans. EPA's final rule published online in December set a federal floor of standards for the safe disposal of coal ash for the first time, and the rule has been decades in the making. The final product was a result of a transparent public process and input from stakeholders, including significant input from the groups represented on today's panel. The rule advances public health protection and protects beneficial reuse, but this bill before us would undermine that federal floor in alarming ways in my opinion, by leaving out important requirements and allowing states to enforce alternative requirements that might be less productive. So do you agree that this, rule, that this bill would undermine the federal floor established by the final rule? Uh, this bill absolutely undermines the federal floor and does not, um, and I have to repeat, does not incorporate uh, the standards in EPA's rule. It incorporates some of the standards, but again, leaves definitions up to the states which can radically alter the implementation and the scope and the stringency of the program. And what are the most important requirements that would be left to state discretion? Uh, well, you've got to, you've eliminated, as I said before, you've eliminated the requirement uh, to uh, make public uh, I'm sorry, make data publicly accessible in a way that's uh, meaningful for the public. And this includes uh, data about the quality of their drinking water, uh, the assessment of wells. Um, and you also have eliminated the requirement uh, for keeping uh, coal ash away from aquifers. Uh, you have taken away the responsibility, the requirement for states to address spills. You've taken away the requirement for um, industry to address releases of hazardous substances. Uh, there are, the important considerations are, are almost too numerous to name. I do, do want to flag one, though, because it's so important after the collapse of the Dan River Pond. Um, these inactive sites, which have not been attended to, you know, sometimes for over a decade, um, that are sitting often close to, uh, to rivers or to sources of drinking water, um, the requirements that uh, pertaining to the closure of inactive sites are not equivalent. I'm hearing again and again that people think that they are, but there are important differences in the closure of legacy sites, not only the extension of time in which to close them, but what regulations apply after three years, none according to the bill, uh, everything according to EPA. And furthermore, uh, utilities can very easily get out of all the closure requirements simply by using that old abandoned pond for disposal of anything. If you dispose of any non-coal ash waste in a legacy pond, it is not subject to the closure requirements. And that could be a really important and dangerous loophole uh, for the inactive sites. Let me just ask one last question, whether in your experience state regulation of coal ash has been effective 
or protective of public health? Absolutely not. And uh, CRS came to that same conclusion when they looked at this. Um, you know, it was EPA's conclusion. The holes were immense in terms of failure to require inspections of high hazard dams, failure to require even monitoring um, of landfills and ponds, failure to require uh, liners for these ponds, and the failure to uh, to require these basic basic safeguards for waste disposal is what has resulted in the spills and the releases and all the damage cases uh, throughout the United States. Right, gentlemen, thank time. you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would again uh, make the point that the, there is no CRS report on this bill. Uh, you're talking about previous CRS reports in previous Congresses with. Uh, different implications. So to compare those is, is, is not proper. Chair recognized gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Hudson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the panelists for being here today. Uh, this is an issue the people of North Carolina are following very closely. There's been a lot of news reports out of North Carolina dealing with coal ash, and it's important that we get this right. Uh, first of all, first and foremost, we've got to protect our environment. Uh, but secondly, we've got to get the balance right when it comes to, to, to certainty of the regulations. And, and so I'd like to go back, revisit that issue with Mr. Rower. Um, does the draft legislation provide regulatory certainty for your member companies regarding whether EPA can revisit the bevel determination in the future and regulate coal ash under uh, subtitle C? The, the, the legislation provides certainty by establishing that permit program under subtitle D. Okay. Um, and if an owner operator misses the deadline to, uh, to complete a safety factor assessment or fails to meet the initial safety factor assessment criteria, the final rule uh, requires that the impoundment cease receipt of coal ash within six months and close within five years. Uh, can you please explain why that's a problem and does the draft legislation address this issue? Uh, in some cases, the design uh, and implementation of an engineering solution to allow a facility to meet that safety factor assessment may take longer than the 18 months EPA has provided in this rule. Uh, we support the application of structural integrity criteria to these units. We need, in some cases, additional time. We want to make sure these units can continue to operate. We're not asking that unsafe units be allowed to continue to operate, but that we be given time to ensure that the, these units meet the safety factors. I think you've addressed that maybe with one of my other colleagues. Some of, but what are some of the factors that, that, that make one situation take longer than another, for example? Uh, one of the complicating factors is that these facilities are subject to permits by state regulatory agencies. And you got to get the approval from the state regulatory agency before you can do any work on that facility, and that can be a lengthy process. And so, so in your, your testimony, need that flexibility? Absolutely. The legislation provides additional time for us to come into compliance with the, with the, the safety factors. And that's very important the legislation does that. Right. Well, thank you for that. Mr. Chairman, I, I would be happy to yield to you if, uh, if you'd like to use the rest of this time. No, I want you to yield back, and we'll let, go to Mr. Johnson. Right. Thank you. Uh, gentleman of the pack of time, Chair recognized the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for five thank, minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I thank the panel for being here today, too. I associate my, uh, myself with the comments of my colleague from North Carolina. This is, a, this is an issue that uh, the people of the great state of Ohio are monitoring very, very closely. We have um, uh, a tremendous number uh, of families that uh, work in the coal industry that are dependent upon the coal industry for their livelihoods. Uh, to support their families, um, and Ohio still gets uh, in excess of 60 percent of its energy from coal. Uh, so it is, uh, it is a, a very, very important issue uh, for people in my district. Uh, Mr. Forbeck, uh, the, the draft res uh, legislation incorporates the definitions from the final rule but allows the states to make changes that may be necessary to tailor the requirements to the needs of the states, but only if the state demonstrates that it has a reasonable basis for making the change. In your opinion, will the states be able to arbitrarily change the definitions and does this minimize the protectiveness of a state permit program? No, I do not think the states can arbitrarily uh, change the definitions. As I said, it has to have a reasonable uh, basis for those changes. Um, an example uh, under Pennsylvania, for example, where coal ash is defined differently than what's under the, the proposed legislation. It doesn't include flue gas desulfurization sludge. However, that the FGD and the coal ash is included under our term residual waste. 
that residual waste is governed in the same manner as the, the coal ash is with the, the protective standards. So it, is it important then, uh, in your opinion, that states be able to adjust the definitions if necessary? In my opinion, yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Forbeck, also, will the draft uh, that you've read, uh, the draft legislation, would that require states to make information like groundwater monitoring data, emergency action plans, fugitive dust control plans, and the results of structural stability assessments available to the public? Yes, it will. Okay. We, we'd heard some, uh, uh, some concerns about that. I, I wanted to clarify that. So all this data is going to be made available to the public. That's correct. Sir. Great. Um, in your opinion, as an experienced state regulator, do you think location restrictions should be imposed retroactively? I think it's important that the location restrictions are looked at at all facilities. However, um, there should be uh, a availability for corrective action and for um, enclosure if issues do occur. It's, it's not possible, as I said, I think, earlier to simply move a facility out. Mm -hmm. um, from a location standards. If there is reason to or there's issues that's been that, that have come up fr from these, then maybe that is some corrective action. If there isn't, which we have seen in sites in, in our region, uh, where we've, we've had groundwater monitoring, et cetera, around a lot of these in, impoundments, that they are operating safely, even though they might not meet the s location standards um, and have been grandfathered. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rohr. Uh, the draft legislation also treats legacy sites in the same way EPA did under the final rule. Uh, inactive impoundments must either close within three years or become subject to all of the requirements applicable to an active disposal unit. In your opinion, is three years always enough time to safely close a surface impoundment? No, it's not. It's a very complicated process, and we need to make sure that that closure is, is environmentally sound and safe. It can take longer than three years, given the size of the unit, uh, the requirements of dewatering it, and then constructing the cap in place. Okay. The draft legislation gives the implementing agency the authority to grant an extension of up to two more years to complete closure. Um, why is the extension necessary, do you think? Uh, the extension, uh, you just yeah, the extension is necessary because we can't always get it done within that three-year time period. We want to close these facilities safely, and that extension would allow us the time necessary to do that. Okay. Um, but certainly we're not going to do these extensions willy-nilly. What would, what would your members have to demonstrate in order to request an extension from the implementing agency? And specifically, if you could focus on the requirement that your members demonstrate that there is no immediate threat of release? The agency, EPA in their rule, has established uh, uh, the ability to extend the closure process for active units. And we'd have to show uh, the same reasons because of climate, uh, size, uh, et cetera, that were required under uh, the provisions to allow an extension of the closure time frame for active units, for inactive units. In addition, we would have to show that the facility is not a, a threat of immediate release. So we're not talking about allowing unsafe facilities uh, to continue to stay there. We're, we're asking an additional time to safely close these facilities. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Gentlemen's time's expired. Uh, or just a reminder, this is a legislative hearing on, a, on draft legislation. And so, as Mr. McKinley said, people who have comments or concerns and can still address uh, myself, Mr. McKinley, and members of this committee as we move forward. Uh, the hearing is going is recessed until Tuesday, March 24th at 2 p.m. in room 2123. The witness will be EPA Assistant Administrator Matthew Stanislaus, a good friend of the committee who's been here numerous times. With that, I uh, recess this hearing.